All right. So I handed back the exam. I want to say the average was around uh, low 30s, like 30, 31, something like that. Um, so that's a middle C, um, which is fine. The high was 40 out of 40. Um, so overall, did all right. Um, a couple of things that were I found interesting um, were problems three and four. So <clears throat> I just thought I'd review these. Problem three was a um, simple machine. So you have this hydraulic cylinder, DE. This is a scissor lift. So the idea is that as you push it, it lifts up, right? So as you, that hydraulic extends, it pushes up. If we look at the members themselves, um, we're asked to find what this force is here. Uh, there's a couple ways you can approach this. Um, the way I did it is I started up here at the platform. And lots of people, first, you need to note that you're given masses, right? But we don't really work with masses when we're summing forces, do we? We need to convert those to forces. So we need to multiply times 9.81. So I first drew a free body diagram of the top where it said uh, the has a uniform mass of the plate of 60 kilograms. Um, and 60 times 9.81, let's see what I got for that, maybe I didn't, 587 it looks like, okay, and then I have 85 kilograms over here, which I calculated as being 834, Wait, did I do this? 834, sorry, I think I looked at the wrong number. I think this is 589. Okay. And then we know that at A, we have AY and AX. And at B, which is right here, we'll just have BY. Okay. So there's only three unknowns for this guy, so I can go ahead and solve. Um, I won't do that because you know how to do that. Um, but I found that BY was 615 newtons and AY was uh, 808 newtons. All right. So the next thing I need to do then is I can look and say, well, I want to know what the force DE needs to be. So let's draw the free body diagram for AD. Okay. So here's A, D. I know at D I'm going to have some dy up, and I'm going to have some dx to the left, which is the force of my hydraulic. At AY, I calculated that there's 808 newtons pushing up on the platform, so that means that it's pushing down here. And I also calculated that AX was zero, so that's the only thing happening there. Now here's where some people started to go awry. They didn't acknowledge that at C, there's actually another connection. And so you need to include CY and CX. And the inclusion of CY and CX make it so that you have four unknowns. And so you aren't able to solve this anymore, right? So we're going to have to go ahead um, and draw the other guy, BF. Okay. And for member BF, we could say that we'll have some FY, some FX. B, we know, 615 newtons down. And then CY, CX, we've already drawn them here, so we have to draw them equal and opposite on this member. Okay. And now if I look between the two of these, I have one, two, three, four, five, six unknowns. And I can write six equations. So for this one, I can say some of the forces in the x has to be equal to zero. And I'll have cx plus dx equals zero, but dx is in the negative, so it'd be cx minus dx. Right? 
I can do sum of the forces and the y has to equal zero. I'll have dy plus cy minus 808 equals zero. And then I can sum the moments about a point. <clears throat> uh, I don't know that it really matters what point. Let's choose D. So then I'll have 808 times the lever arm of 3 minus CY times the lever arm of 1.5 minus CX times the lever arm of 1 equals 0. So again, four unknowns there, so I have to come over and write a set of equations for uh, this uh, member, what is this, BF. So some of the forces in the X, I'll have uh, F sub X minus CX equals 0. Some of the forces in the Y, I'll have F sub Y minus CY minus 615 equals 0. And then I'll sum the moments. Um, oh, what the heck. Let's sum them about F. Got to make it a 0. So I'll have uh, CX times 1 minus CY times 1.5 minus 615 times 3 equals zero. And with these six equations, you can go ahead and solve. And I got that the force DE was, I think, 2,134 newtons. Okay. Questions on this one? Now on this guy, um, I know there was lots of stress over these. Um, the first step was solving for the reactions. Um, I did that and got, uh, well first off, let me say I did that by just summing the moments about A to get me what BC was, all right? And I found that FBC was uh, 2,250 pounds, and AY was zero. So this beams pretty much perfectly balanced around this because of that twisty force on the end. So what that tells me is there's zero here, and there's 2,250 here which I believe resulted in 1,800 up. So I could right from that point draw my shear moment diagrams. Okay, So I have a negative slope of 600 Newton meters for 2 meters. That's going to get me to negative 1,200. Then I jump up 18. That's going to get me to 600. And I have a negative slope again back down to zero. Then looking at this graph, I can say I have a negative change as I go from 0 to 2. The area underneath the curve, it's a, it's a negative slope, increasingly negative. The change is going to be uh, 1,200 times 2 divided by 2, or 1,200. It's going to look like that. And then as I go from negative uh, 1,200 over to three meters, or from two meters to three meters, I have a positive change, so a positive slope that's decreasingly positive. The amount of change would be the area underneath this, so this is one, so 600 times one divided by two because it's a triangle gives me a change of 300. So that means I go from <clears throat> negative 1,200, and I'm going to do something like this to negative 900, but then I have a clockwise twisty on the end of the beam, which causes a jump in the graph vertical, and that's my bending moment diagram. Okay. 
For those of you that got the uh, Choose Your Own Adventure alternative ending, let me do that problem for you because people were concerned that I was unfairly mean to people. I don't think that I was. Um, let me find what the problem showed. Okay, so if you got the alternative ending, it was a beam that looked like this. Yeah, I gave uh, two exams in the afternoon. Okay. This one is actually equally as easy even though it's got a triangle. I know you don't believe me, but watch. So I solved for the reactions, uh, which I don't think I actually have my numbers with me, so I might actually have to do it. That sucks. Um, ba -ba -ba. Oh, I don't have it with me, so I'm going to have to figure it out. Um, I think this is three as well. I'm not sure I'm doing this right. Yep. Okay, so first thing I need to do, the, the beam is supported at A and B, so I need to solve for my reactions there. So I'm going to do that by saying some of the forces in the Y is equal to zero of AY plus BY, and then I'll have, what, uh, three times 100 down would be 300, and another 300, so minus 600, and then 100 times 3 is 300 divided by 2, another 150 equals 0. And I'll sum the moments about A and say that's equal to 0 counterclockwise. I'll have 300 times 1.5 negative minus 300 times 1.5 because I have both the distributed load and I have a point load, right? So the distributed load of 100 Newton meters times 3 meters, this distributed load, gives me a second 300 value that's in the middle. So there's a total of 600, 1.5 over. Um, my 100 Newton meters, that'd give me 150, because 100 times 3 is 300, divided by 2 is 150. Uh, so that would be, well, I'll keep going left to right. So plus BY times 3 uh, minus 150 times 4 <coughs> because it's 1 third, 2 thirds. Uh, minus 300 Newton meters equals 0. So let's see, uh, this would be 300 times 1.5 is going to give me 450 and 450 would be negative 900, negative 1500, negative 1800. So BY times 3 is equal to 1800, or BY is equal to 600. That means that AY is equal to 150. All right. So I know 150, 600, and I can do my shear and moment diagrams now. Okay, so here's shear. I jump up 150 right at the beginning. 
I then have a negative slope of uh, downward of 100 newtons per meter, and I go over one and a half meters, so I go down to zero. Then I jump down 300. Okay. I continue my negative slope. Uh, at a rate of 100 newtons per meter for one and a half meters, so I end up at negative 450. At which point I jump up 600, so that takes me back to 150. I again then, uh, now I have a negative 100 slope that's decreasingly negative, and I have a change of the area underneath that, so it'd be three times... Um, 100 divided by 2, or 150, so I'm going to do something like that. That's my shear diagram. Okay. Now looking just at this, I can do my moment diagram. Well, I shouldn't say just at this, because I do have a twisty at the end. So I have a very positive slope, decreasingly positive, and it goes to zero right here, meaning it's going to be flat. The amount of change is the area underneath this, so it would be 150 times 1.5 divided by 2. So 150 times 1.5 is 225 divided by 2, this is 112.5. Very positive, decreasingly positive. Okay. Then I jump to a, a negative slope that's increasingly negative. Okay, so I'm going down, and I have a very negative change. I can figure out what that change is. 300 times 1.5 is going to be 450. And then 150 times 1.5 uh, divided by 2 is 112.5. So I'm going to end up down here at negative 450. And I'm going to do that by having a very negative and increasingly negative slope. Something like this. Okay. Then uh, I need to find the area underneath this guy. Well, that's kind of going to suck, but I know that if I go back to here, I have a jump up of 300 at the end. And wouldn't you know it, you can actually find that this is a positive slope, decreasingly positive. It looks like that. It goes to uh, 300 right there. That's negative 450. and you have your shear moment diagram. Okay? Any other questions folks had on the exam? Really? Okay. This one is not definitely easier, but it is quite solvable, right? You just have to stick to your guns of knowing that the uh, a point load causes a jump, a distributed load causes a negative slope, the uh, value of the shear diagram gives you the slope of the moment diagram, the area underneath the shear diagram gives you the change in the moment diagram. Okay. Yes, ma'am. A distributed load? Would it give you a positive slope? Only if, it was, if you had a distributed load that was up. So the question was, would a distributed load ever give you a positive slope? The answer is yes, if I had a distributed load like that, that was up, you know, give you a positive slope. Okay? When would that happen in the real world? Uh, when I put a big fat helium balloon underneath this, right? I mean, uh, actually, a better case would be any boat. Right? Because it's a distributed fluid pressure on the bottom of the boat holding it up. Yep. Okay. So I thought the exam was pretty reasonable. Um, if you have questions, feel free to come by office hours. We can chat. We're moving into chapter eight. All right, so let's look at our calendar. Today is the 20th, okay?
Okay. Time does go by fast. Next week, we only have class on Monday. So we have Friday and Monday. And then the following week, we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then finals week. This week, we have Friday. Next week, we only have Monday. The following week, we'll have Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then finals are here. I believe our final is on Monday. Is that correct? Okay. All right. So we only have one, two, three, four, five classes left. Okay. And an exam. We are, I think we're just going to do chapter eight. So we're closing in. Final will be comprehensive. Yep, it'll cover everything. So, all right. So here we go. Chapter 8, Capitulo 8. Capitulo. My wife always corrects me on how I say it. I say it wrong. Does anybody know how to say it correctly? Capitulo? Huh? Spanish, capitulo ocho, chapter eight, friction, okay, so what do you know about friction, slows things down, okay, elsewise things will just keep moving, okay, what else do you know about friction? What's that? Friction is annoying to solve for, okay? It's opposite of movement. Okay, so friction impedes motion, right? It is the enemy of motion. Okay, what else do you know about friction? Often it generates heat, yeah, absolutely. Is friction a good thing or a bad thing? It's good and bad, says the team of guys. Okay, there's static friction and kinetic friction. If you're trying to walk, friction is good. If you're trying to push something heavy, friction not so good. Okay, so when... Where, uh, where is a place that you, you'd say we use friction in a positive way? Brakes. The brakes on your car. Anybody know how the brakes on your car work? All right, so you have a disc. Let's, let's make this a multimedia presentation. Getting fancy. I realize I'm sitting in front of a giant computer that I could use to pull this up on, but no. Okay, so let's look at this here disc brake on Wikipedia. Or is it Wikimedia? Hmm, right? So here's a disc brake. There's a, why do you think it's called a disc brake? Because it's a disc! Right? Okay, so we have this disc. These right here are bolt holes, right, where you might tighten your wheel onto this here doohickey, okay? Um, but this guy's spinning with your wheel, and it's your disc rotor, is what we would call that. This is the caliper, this red thing. They actually work better if they're painted some obnoxiously neon color like red. Not true, but some people seem to believe that. Meh. Um, Inside these are these pads. So let's let's see it. Disc brake pad. You can learn a lot on the old Google. Okay. So these are what those pads look like. Oh no, that's shopping. Here we go. Okay. They look like this. They clip in that caliper, and you can see they're kind of a uh, ceramic or semi-metallic material. 
Um, they've got little bits of metal and little bits of ceramic, and they're all glued up. And what happens is that these guys smash against that break, okay? And when they're smashed against that break, friction happens, okay? That's a good thing. When is friction, when can you think of an example where friction, we want to combat friction? Yes, putting oil in your car. Why do you put oil in your car? To combat friction, right? So interestingly, we think, has anyone ever heard of the journal bearings in your car? Journal bearings? I feel like you're lying. Okay, someone describe to me the typical pieces in a bearing. What's a bearing look like? Two discs with balls. Let's just do, here, let's do this. A fidget spinner, yes, exactly. A fidget spinner is somebody in China deciding that uh, we should put three ball bearings together and sell it at gas stations for way too much money, right? So when we think that, uh, of bearings, we think of something like this, right? There's an outer race, that's this outer diameter. There's an inner race, that's this inner piece. And then there's balls between them, okay? And the idea is that rather than having two shafts just run against each other, which would generate friction, friction maybe we'll make it so that nothing is sliding. These balls just spin in this bearing, right? This is a thrust bearing or a, a conical bearing. Let it catch up to me here. It has rollers. You can see it's kind of the shape of a cone. Let's see if we have any better pictures of a uh, of a thrust bearing here. There's, see how that's tapered? Right? That's because this bearing is designed not only to take side loads in X and Y, but it can also take loads along the axis of rotation. Okay, so this is, we talked about this when we were doing 3D equilibrium. So this bearing here, it's not designed to take any, to resist any load along the axis of rotation, right? It can resist loads perpendicular to that axis, like if I said y and x, it can resist those loads. But if I pushed on this hard enough, what do you think would happen? Yeah, those ball bearings would just go all over everywhere, right? I could hit it with a sledgehammer and the ball bearings would all break out the other side. My bearing doesn't work so good anymore, okay? Now, uh, a cone conical bearing like this, this is what you would have like a wheel bearing in your car. This is designed to take loads both X and Y and in Z, right? Because these guys, interestingly, actually, I guess I should point out, this is only designed to carry a thrust load. I guess it can carry it in both directions. If I push down on it, there's a, this is not showing the outer race. Let's see if we can find one of these with an outer race on it. Here we go, this guy. This is a tapered roller bearing. The, the ring here is... Uh, is the outer race, the inner race is the inside, and these little conical cylinders ride around that guy, okay? That makes it so that if, if I put a load kind of vertically on this, on this outer ring, you could see that it would try and smash those little cone things. Let me draw a picture, right? I'm going to cut this guy in half. Right, so I've cut it in half. That's the inner race. Okay, so what I've drawn here is this inner ring cut in half. Now I'm going to draw, I have some little rollers that go along here. And maybe they're tapered just a little bit. Or they can be flat, either way. Okay, so what I've drawn there are these little individual rollers that go around. And they're in what's called the cage. That keeps all the rollers where they're supposed to be, okay? So those things they, yep. They're just like a rolling pin. They just roll along the outside of that. Then I have the, and again, I've cut this in half, right? So then I have the outer race. Yes. 
the other ring, this guy here, sits on top of these. And you can see now my rings could spin. I should bring in some new gear bearings so you guys can see these in real life. But <clears throat> hmm. So there you go. That's, that is a tapered roller bearing. Okay. So this guy is designed so that if I put a load on it in this direction and I support this, I'm just smashing these guys, right? I'm not going to push them out anywhere as long as this ring doesn't break, you know, expand out, and this ring doesn't crush in. I can carry an axial load. Whereas in a normal roller bearing, all we have is an inner race, a ball, a ball, and an outer race, right? And in this case, if I push too hard, that ball is just going to break the cage out and it will move. All right. So here's why I wanted to talk to you about bearings, though, because you were saying that in your engine you want to put oil in them. Part of the reason is because you have some bearings in your engine that look like this. They aren't the main bearings, though. You have a crankshaft in your motor. Let's let Google help us. Not a rank shaft, a crank shaft. Okay? This is what a crank shaft looks like. Okay? So this crank shaft spins. <clears throat> uh, let's see, this is probably the front of your motor. This is the back, likely. And it spins along an axis between these two points. Okay? But you'll see there's offset journals on it. And right here and right here is where the pistons of your motor connect. Okay, so very simply, um, let me go back and see Wikipedia can help us with some, or Google, I guess. Piston and I know I could type it on the computer. I like this. Okay, here we go. So here's that. This is a four-cylinder motor. They've reversed it. Now this is the back of the motor. This is the front. And you can see that the pistons run on this crank. Okay, so this thing spins. You can see right here, right here, right there, right there, and right there is where the crankshaft is supported. Is it? Um, no, it doesn't. So there are one, two, three, four, five journal bearings in this motor. So it would be a five main bearing. And what that means is that this crankshaft is held in five bearings that allow it to spin. All right? What do you think the bearings look like here? Okay, they'd be sideways. Yeah, they'd be up on edge. Do you, are, do you think you use a ball bearing, a thrust bearing? What do you use there? A ball bearing. Okay. I'll, I'll give you that. All right, so let's think about it. Could we get, I'm going to go back to uh, one of these other images, maybe. Let's go to this one that's kind of isometric. How would you get a ball bearing on, nope. Uh, let's do this one. Okay, so this is a journal. I need a bearing there. How would I get it on there? Good question. Is the crankshaft fused together? It is. Crankshafts are built in one piece. Two halves. So Liana says, well, you'd have to take two halves of a bearing and put it together. It's reasonable. Ball bearings are very, very precise, though. Okay. So we'd have to, like, weld it on or have some sort of split bearing or something. And actually, I want to show you the type of bearing you use there. Liana's got it close to right. It's called a journal bearing because it goes on the journal of the crankshaft. And this is what they look like. Um, right here. 
You see any balls? What do you see? What do, tell me what you see. Okay, rings. What about the rings? There's holes in them and slots, right? Can you see that? There's a groove that goes right along here. Nope. There's no balls. So what's cool about, or an interesting fact about your engine, is that you don't actually have the, when you hear journal bearing, there's no ball in a journal bearing. Here we go. So what you're going to do, see, these are the journal bearings. You're putting oil on them. Those grooves are for oil. The reason you need oil in your motor, these are actually often made out of aluminum. Okay. Here you go. Here's a good drawing. Okay. So the way your crankshaft is mounted in the engine, this is the bottom of an engine block. Hey, stick with me or I'm going to stop and we're going to do boring things. So this is the bottom of the engine. You're sticking your crankshaft in it. You have upper and lower main bearings, meaning that these go above the crankshaft and these go below the crankshaft in the motor. Okay? They're typically made out of aluminum, which is a terrible, like horrible friction surface. Okay? No, they should use aluminum to make these. The idea is that your crankshaft is never actually supposed to touch those. You leave about a thousandth gap in your engine, um, and that is filled with oil. So what you end up with, a journal bearing is actually a fluid bearing. What you're trying to do is you have the journal of your crankshaft, you have a bearing cap. This is typically like some cast iron piece. You have some big bolts. These are main bearing bolts. Then you have the block, your engine block. Okay, so this is cap. This is the block. And what happens is you tighten these bolts down and this clamps shut. But in between, you have your journal bearings. Ooh, and I did a bad job drawing that. It looks like it touches. It doesn't actually touch. And what you leave is a very small gap. And you have an oil pump in your car. And that oil pump pumps oil through, uh, actually through the block. So there's be a hole right here. It pumps it into that bearing, and then that oil runs around the slot. So that... If we look at that journal again, it's actually running in a bed of oil. One of the ways you start, when you start losing oil pressure in your car, it's because these bearings are getting worn out. And so oil can shoot, because all that's happening is you're pumping the oil in and it gets squeezed right out. And so the looser this gets, the easier it is to shoot the oil out the edges. And eventually, it can become so much that it can't maintain the pressure, and that crankshaft, which is made out of some hardened steel, will contact the soft aluminum. Right? The main bearings, they be cheap. They're made out of aluminum, aluminum easy to replace. Crankshaft, not cheap. Not easy to replace. So if you're going to lose oil pressure, and if the crankshaft is going to, if, if they're going to come into contact with each other, you want the aluminum to be sacrificed before you damage the crankshaft. Okay? But the idea is we're combating friction here by putting oil between these two things. Does what happen often? No. So the question is, how often do you have to replace these bearings? Depends on how often you change your oil and how, how good you are at keeping your oil full. Okay. Yep. So if you, if you run out of oil, can you see what the problem would be here? There would be no luscious, oily waterbed for this thing to spin on. It would be spinning steel on aluminum 
it would destroy that aluminum in short order. And then your engine, it no work you very good. Okay? All right? Great question. Why is aluminum a good material? Because it won't damage the steel. The steel will just obliterate the aluminum, and you'll realize you have a problem, likely, and someone will take apart your motor, and they will say, okay, I can take these aluminum pieces out and replace them for like five bucks and put the motor back together, and we'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, the labor cost of taking apart the engine is much, much more than five bucks. Absolutely. The actual parts to rebuild a motor are not that expensive, like three to five hundred dollars maybe. But the cost of having a rebuilt motor put in your car is like five thousand because there's lots of stuff you need to know how to do. It's actually not very hard. Any of you are capable of doing this, right? If you can make it through engineering, actually, I'm going to walk that statement back just a little bit. Any of you who read your textbook are capable of doing this, right? Because if you can read instructions, you can do, this is not rocket science, right? Okay. Or you could just watch a YouTube video, absolutely. That is how I do a lot of things, okay? All right. So friction. I'm sure you watch a lot of YouTube videos. I'm just not sure if you watch a lot of YouTube videos that teach you anything. I don't know who Jeff Hansen is. Oh, so you're watching another statics teacher. You unfaithful student. It's not like that. <laughs> sure, sure it isn't. <laughs> yeah, Natasha? Yeah. Yeah. I had a little dump truck and I had my son drive it with me in the back and he'd lift up the dump bed so that I could prune trees and he'd just pull from tree to tree. Yeah. He can drive. He was seven. Why is that so All right. So. <laughs> Let's talk about friction. We are going to get something out of this lecture, I promise. Hopefully you learned something about your car engine. Friction can be good, it can be bad. We're talking about dry friction, which is not what I just described to you. So what's happening with that oil is fluid friction. Okay? You will do that next year in fluid mechanics. You'll look at fluid friction. Okay? So <clears throat> lots of fascinating things to do with fluid friction. We're talking about dry friction which is a little bit of a different ball of wax, okay? And I'm not going to try and draw this. I'm just going to put up this little, this here little diagram, and I'll focus on it so you can see it. What's that? There's what? Yes, there is a distributed load at the bottom. Thank you. Going up, okay? So the idea is if we've got this block, has some weight W, and we're going to pull on it with the force P. Okay. We know that it doesn't instantly start moving. Right? Have you experienced this? You have a you try and push something, you give it just a little bit of force, it's not moving. You increase that force, increase that force, and eventually it will move. That's friction. Right? Because the block is sitting on a surface, because the dresser is sitting on the carpet, because the car is sitting on the road, because the refrigerator is sitting in the kitchen, because the vending machine got your, stole your money and is sitting on the concrete, all of those things, when you try to push them, they don't move immediately. So you apply more and more load until they move, typically. Well, what, what's actually going on there? A couple things. First, since we're engineers, we draw a free body diagram to try and figure this out. Okay. We're going to advance just a little bit from our understanding. We used to say that there was just a normal force that was smack dab in the middle of this, right? 
Well, huh, okay. Now we're going to say there's, there's actually a distributed load. Okay, so that this block has a distributed force. <clears throat> and that what's happening when we pull on it, there must be some force. If it's not accelerating, Newton's laws would tell us that there's an equal and opposite reaction. So say this is a 100-pound block, and I pull on it with one pound. Do you think it's going to move? I mean, if it's on ice, it might, but we're going to say that it's on carpet. Okay, 100-pound box on carpet, and I put one pound pulling it sideways. Is it going to slide? Survey says, no, it's not. Why is it not? Because of friction. How much friction must there be in order for it not to be moving? Exactly one pound. Not more than, not less than, right? Because Newton's law says it takes a force imbalance for things to accelerate. So in order for this to change what's going on, I need to have a force imbalance. So if I pull on it with one pound and it doesn't move, how much friction is acting? 10 pounds? 10 pounds, right? So that means that it's exactly what it is. Up until a point where all of a sudden it breaks free. Let's say that's at 20 pounds. I, I'm pulling on it with 20 pounds, and it starts to move. Okay? What has happened is that I have overcome this force of static friction. All right? What's causing that static friction? Well, you can imagine this is the bottom of the box here. So we've zoomed in on this little piece. And we're looking at the bottom of the box. And it turns out that microscopically there's a bunch of little ridges here. And it turns out microscopically the floor that it's sitting on is not exactly even. And there's a bunch of little teeth that interact with each other. Okay, And as I pull, there is some normal on that tooth that is going to be at a diagonal, right? And that normal, the, the horizontal, we're calling the force of friction. The vertical, we're, we're calling the normal force of the box. So perhaps a more accurate uh, free body diagram would look like this guy on the right, where we have our weight acting down through the geometric center. We have a normal that's acting some distance off. We have a force that we're pulling with, and we have the force of friction. Why is it important that the normal not be right in line with the weight? Let me just do these two. Is this in static equilibrium? If the box is just acted on by P and F, are we in static equilibrium? Uh, it doesn't matter. Let's say, let's say it has not overcome it yet. Are we in static equilibrium if P and F are equal and opposite? Yeah. Really? If P and F are equal and opposite, are we in static equilibrium? You guys are only, you guys are only doing two of the equations of equilibrium if you think we're in static equilibrium here. It's going to be twisting, right? Because if P and F are equal and opposite, and they're separated by a distance, what are they? They're a couple moment. So this guy would be twisting. What direction would it be twisting? Clockwise. All right? Can every, everyone see that? If P and F are equal and opposite, they form a couple moment. And therefore, this is not in static equilibrium. It's going to start spinning. Okay. How is that counteracted? When we push on a box on the ground, it doesn't start rolling, typically. That happens because the normal force is no longer directly underneath the center of mass. The normal force now is this. Which, which direction of a couple would this cause? Counterclockwise. Spoiler alert, they counteract each other. Right? Now, does this ever not work? When would this not work? If I pulled really hard at the top and it was a very tall box, what would you expect to happen? You'd expect it to tip before it slides. Right? So that's something we're going to have to figure out. When we're pushing on something, one, 
Does it have enough oomph to slide? If it does have enough oomph to slide, does it tip before it slides? Okay. All right. So it turns out, after much experimentation, we've determined that the force of static friction is equal to, or is proportional to, the normal. So this is saying that if I have a box that weighs 100 pounds, and I know that the static friction on it is 20 pounds, I could fi figure out mu static is 0.2 between that box and this surface. Now, the coefficient of static friction is always, it's a material parameter that's experimentally defined. It is not a theoretical parameter that we come to by some formula. We experimentally, or it's empirically derived, meaning we put two things together of known weight, and we try pushing on them, and we figure out what the coefficient of static friction is. There are some typical values for static friction right here. So metal on ice, 0.03 to 0.05. So if we went ice skating... Maybe that's what we should do on Friday instead of lecture. Let's all meet at Lloyd Center and go ice skating. I plan to make fun of most of you if we do that, just so you know. No, uh, that would be rad, but no, we're not actually going to do that. Okay? You, yes, you guys certainly can. If you would like to, I'm going to air quotes for the video, study by going to the ice rink, you can. It's also called a date, though, I'm just telling you. Anyone that takes a girl to an ice rink, any male that takes a girl to an ice rink has gone on a date, whether he knows it or not. I'm just, you're engineers, so I want to clarify that for you. If a male and a female go to an ice rink, it's called a date. Okay? Sorry. Man. I don't know if we're getting much out of this lecture today. <laughs> what if it's your sister? Fair question, not a date. Okay? <clears throat> That's no excuse. Um, okay, so kinetic friction, what does static mean? What does kinetic mean? Okay, that's the difference between static and kinetic friction. Because it turns out if we plot the coefficient of friction... Or actually, if we plot the friction force, whoa, that's crazy. I didn't move anything. <laughs> what did I do? I broke it. <laughs> I didn't move the camera. I understand that it has moved, but I pushed this. Woo, welcome to the twilight zone. That is going to be on the video. No, it's not. All right. Sorry. So here's a typical plot of how friction works. If I've got a block and I start applying a, this is the pulling force. On the abscissa, on the vertical axis, we've got the friction force, okay? So they are one-to-one -one as long as we're in static equilibrium, up to the point where we, meet, where we reach the maximum friction force, which we're calling static friction. And that's where we say that static friction is equal to mu static times the normal. I certainly did, just write on the textbook, okay? Well, so the question is, we don't need to worry about motion in this class. True, we don't need to worry about accelerating motion. So we could be sliding, right? We could have constant motion. So it could happen, or what typically happens, if you plot the force that's on something to keep it moving, all of a sudden, after you hit this static friction, it drops substantially, and you go to kinetic friction. 
And what happens then is that typically the amount of force required to keep something moving goes down. So the kinetic friction is equal to mu kinetic times the normal. Kinetic friction is always equal to this. Static friction is not always equal to this. So static friction is always uh, less than or equal to, so less than or equal to mu static times the normal. Okay. If we say a block is about to move, the ladder is about to slide, the uh, snowboard is about to go down the mountain. Those are all key words, right? About to, impending, almost, right? That is telling, that's the problem trying to tell you that the, we're right at the cusp of motion. And so the force of friction is equal to the force of static friction, which is mu static times the normal. Okay. Let's try a couple problems with this. I've yammered quite a bit. I'm not sure I'm really teaching you much. The problem is attractive. It won't help myself. Mm -hmm. Why don't I need a tractor? <laughs> I do, so that I can have a tractor. <laughs> All right, so here we go. A tractor exerts a towing force of 400 pounds. Determine the normal reactions of each of the two front and two rear tires and the tractive force F on each rear tire needed to pull the load forward at constant velocity. The tractor has a weight of 7,500 pounds and a center of gravity located at GT. An additional weight of 600 pounds is added to its front, having a center gravity at GA. Take mu static equals 0.4. The front wheels are free to roll. All right. Go ahead and draw our free body diagram in your notes, and I'm going to draw one, and we'll see who draws better tractors. Uh, ground. Point B is on the ground. It'll be a day. <clears throat> so Brandon has, for our viewing audience, has decided that he thinks it is a great idea to take his girlfriend on a date to the ice rink to, to study friction. 
I hope that on your date you, you, you spend a lot of time reciting portions of the textbook about friction, dry friction, how interesting uh, journal bearings are, all about it. And so I think what you should probably do, Brandon, on this date is you should probably say, okay, now stand perfectly still and I'm going to push you on your forehead and we're going to see if you fall over or slide. And then you have her crouch down and you do the same thing. It's going to do wonders for your dating relationship. Yep. Say, my professor says this is a good idea. Yes, go very fast. All right. Everyone got a picture of the tractor? What does our free body diagram look like? What's our free body diagram going to look like? So I've drawn what we were told. What else goes on this? Which what? Okay, force of friction. Where would the force of friction be acting? On A? On C. It was an A, and then I scribbled it out. Okay. And would it be going to the left or to the right? It's going to be going to the right. Wait a second. But we're moving to the right. How can the force of friction be to the right? I thought the force of friction resisted motion. Okay, if you think about it, what, what Brendan is saying is that the wheel is spinning like this in order for the tractor to be headed in that direction. So think about what would happen uh, if the tractor ran into a wall, a really, really hard wall, and that kept spinning. It would be sliding against the ground which way? The surface of it would be going that way, so the friction would be counteracting it, right? Or you could say, I mean, it's more feasible to think about a tractor running into a wall than it is a tractor doing a peel out, right, when you're on your bike. Remember when you're on your bike and you really step on the pedals and you could do a burnout, super fun? Well, what's happening there, friction is pushing it forward because the impending motion is of the tire sliding to the left on the surface, so the force of friction's to the right. All right. How about uh, any other forces on this? Yeah, I've got a normal at C and a normal at B. So it, friction doesn't act on the second one. I mean, it does, but it doesn't because it's saying it's free to roll. So it's inconsequential is what we're saying for now. Yep, I know. Okay. So now we can just write, uh, it looks like we have one, two, three unknowns. So we should be able to solve this problem, right? So let's take some of the forces in the x, set that equal to zero. What acts in the x? Anything else? How come we don't know that the force of friction, uh, we could also say that force of friction is uh, mu static times the normal, right? Right? This tells us that the force of friction is 400 pounds. But wait a second, it looks to me like the, the uh, well, let's find the normals C and D. So let's sum the forces in the y direction and set it equal to zero. In C plus in B, minus 7,500 minus 600 equals zero. Or in C plus in B minus 8,100 equals zero. Let's sum the moments. Where would you guys choose to sum the moments about? Why C? Uh, so does B, though. So B 
he would get rid of two because the line of action of the force of friction goes through it too. Everyone see that? Line of action of the force of friction goes through B. So it also, but let's go, let, I'll choose C. That's fine. It really doesn't. Really doesn't. So, so if I sum the moments about C, it looks like I've got 400 pounds times 2.5 feet oops, uh, minus 7,500 pounds times 5 feet plus normal at B times 9 -er feet minus 600 times 12 feet equals zero. There's no, yeah, there's, that'd be internal. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, so, oh gosh, let's see. 400 times two and a half, that's 1,000. 7,500 times five, ooh. That hurts. 37,500? Seventy-two hundred. So what's NB equal? How much? So that would make NC eighty one hundred minus forty eight fifty five is going to be thirty one thirty two thirty three thirty two forty five. Is it 3245? Okay. But I thought the force of friction was equal to mu static, 0.4, times the normal at C, 3245. Which... You do that in your head. Twelve ninety eight. What the heck? Why is the force of friction in our problem only four hundred when mu static times the normal is twelve ninety eight? It says I'm moving at a constant rate though. The wheel isn't sliding, that's right. So remember our plot of force of friction and P? It does something like this, right? 1298 is right here. We're at 400 down here. What's that? Well, we're moving. It's not about to do a burnout. Okay. What's the maximum 
that this tractor could pull before it started peeling out. So 198 pounds. In fact, if it actually, uh, let's say that mu kinetic is 0.3, because the kinetic coefficient of friction is typically lower than the static coefficient of friction, almost always. Very, very rare. I can't think of a time where it is. But I believe there are times, but I cannot think of one. So <clears throat> if the kinetic friction is 0.3, and for a moment, uh, I pull with 1,300 pounds, what's going to happen? It's going to start burning out. And then what's the maximum amount of pull that I have while I'm peeling out? It's lower. The force of friction when I'm peeling out with the tractor is not, no, sorry, 32.45. Sorry, I took the last force of friction instead of, right, this is the normal. NC is 32.45. 973.5. This is the burnout drops off. Yeah. yeah. So the question is if we look back in the textbook graph. See how the curve drops off? Brandon wants to know why the curve drops off there. I don't know. I have an idea. What's your idea? The faster you go, the more skipping across those little things you're going to do. I think that makes sense. At some point, you're just, when you think about this, if you have, um, or if you just have a, a, a block on a string, right, and you're pulling it on the ground, at some time, it's going to just start skipping along the ground, and it'll be in the air, right? So I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's my guess. So I want to talk a little bit about this. The burnout force of friction is 973.5. The non-burnout maximum force of friction is 1298. If you go out after this class and you decide to go drag racing, Go into the back parking lot, get in your car. Is it best for you to light them up, burn rubber? Will that be your fastest launch? No, the answer is no, it will not be your fastest launch. Because the friction is so much less, right? Your fastest launch is if you can accelerate without spinning a wheel. This is why traction control makes cars faster sometimes, right? Because it will, because you, uh, an inexperienced driver like you and I, would just say, oh, I want to go fast. Let's mash that pedal to the floor. And you just peel out and burn rubber, okay? But cars are getting faster for you and I because cars are smart enough. Sports cars have traction control that they can tell right at the moment you're about to start slipping and they'll cut the throttle just a little bit. So they keep you right on that ragged edge. It's the opposite of anti-lock brakes, right? So if you go out, this is probably better, and you see someone crossing the street in front of you and you decide to slam on the brakes, is it best to skid or is it best to have your wheels turning right at the point they're about to skid? Right at the point. Those two things, it allows you to steer, that's good, and it allows you to stop more quickly. That's why ABS brakes actually help you stop quicker by not allowing them to lock up. Right? That's what they're called, anti-lock brakes. Right? They don't want your wheels to just stop and you to skid. It takes longer to stop that way. Right? And you, you can experience this in the snow even with your anti-lock brakes or in the ice. You step on the brakes, and if you convince them to skid, you'll realize you stop slowing down pretty much. It's only if you use that little bit of rolling and brake you actually slow down. Okay? All right. 
that'll be it for our introduction to friction. We'll talk about it again on Friday. Have a great day.